Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you're all well. I'm just going to start our session off today by doing a quick sound check. If you can hear me, please type yes in your chat box. Just lets me know that we're live. You can hear us and the audio is good. Can everybody hear me? That's perfect. Thank you, everybody, for doing that. Great, thank you. So just a quick introduction from myself. My name is Chantal Newton and I'm the marketing manager at the UK Contact Centre Forum and editor of our online e-magazine Contact Centre Monthly. Just a few housekeeping points to go through before we begin. After our presentation today, we will be holding a Q&A session with our presenters. Please post any questions that you may have for our group uh, in the chat box uh, that you've just done your sound check in. This webinar is expected to last 45 minutes. If you're unable to stay the whole session, the webinar is being recorded and the link will be emailed to all participants within, within 24 hours of the webinar ending. After the webinar has ended today, we have a quick feedback survey. This is completely anonymous and will only take a couple of minutes to complete. Your feedback will enable us to keep improving these sessions and deliver what you, our audience, wants in the future. So to get today's session started, I'm just going to hand you over to Neil Holtham. He's the Executive Team Manager from Emerging Media O2. Thank you, Neil. Thank you, Chantal. Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to Emerging Media O2. We're super excited to share with you today our new way of working in relation to our escalator complaints process. We have some outstanding results to share with you today, which we've achieved in such a short space of time. Just before we get started, I do need to make everyone aware that we're only four months into this process and we're still analysing the data. So I know there's questions at the end, but we may not be able to answer all your questions, but what we hope to do is come back in the new year and give you an update on our progress. So can I have the first slide, please? Fantastic, thank you. So we've got an agenda for you today, guys. I'm firstly going to introduce myself and my co-presenter and also introduce you to two very special guests. Then I'm going to tell you a little bit about Virgin Media O2. Next, we're going to talk you through our complaint and escalation process prior to a new way of working. We will then share with you a little bit about CSAS and how they support us with our complaints when a customer has exhausted our complaints process. We're then going to share some CSAS claims with you from 2018 right up until March 2021. Next, we're very excited to share a new way of working with you and some of the numbers and success we've seen since March 2021, right up until July 2021. Finally, we'll share some complaint uh, feedback with you in terms of the reject complaints that we have delivered to the, to the business. Okay, so next slide, please. Okay. So I'll start by introducing myself. My name is Neil Holtham, along with Charlotte, who will be introducing herself shortly. We look after two of the executive complaints team here at Virgin Media Two. I also look after the new way of working team that we've created, but a little bit more about that later on in the presentation. Um, Charlotte, at this point, you want to say hello to the team? Yeah, thanks, Neil. So yeah, my name is Charlotte Ken. I'm also one of the executive team managers within Virgin Media O2. Um, along with Neil, um, within our team, our CEO team, we'll deal with complaints um, that come in via our HODs, um, along with complaints that come in through the wider business. Um, yep, yeah, so back over to you, Neil. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm also very proud and privileged to introduce two very special guests that are awaiting your questions. First, we have Justine Gould. Justine is a senior manager in the dispute resolution team. Her team deals directly with CSAS. But any questions regarding the relationship with CSAS, Justine is the best person to answer these for you. Next, we have Tracy Dean. Tracy is currently living and breathing the new way of working. She's part of the new team we have created, and any questions in relation to the new team or the new way of working, Tracy is anticipating all your questions. Okay, next slide, please. Thank you. So, who who is Virgin Media um, O2? So, before we get into the new process, I want to share with you a little bit about Virgin Media O2. This presentation is an excellent opportunity to show off our new old Virgin Media O2 branding. For those of you unaware, we've launched our partnership with O2 on the 1st of June, combined UK's largest, most reliable mobile network with a broadband network offering the fastest, widely available broadband speeds. 
We have 47 million UK connections across broadband, mobile, TV, and on phone. Our own fixed network currently passes 16.3 million premises, along with a mobile network that covers 99% of the nation's population with 4G and 180 towns and cities with 5G services. We currently have 3.5 million mobile subscribers, as well as 45,000 business currently being served. We also have 6.1 million cable customers. At this point, I'm going to introduce to Charlotte, who will take you to the next slides. Thanks, Neil. Yeah, Chantal, if we can have the next one, please. Perfect. So within this slide here, I'm just going to give you all a bit of background as to what our previous um, customer ownership process looked like um, before we actually went into the new way of working. So as you can see here, there are three stages to the old process. Stage one is where the customer comes into us and makes a complaint, um, ideally through our frontline staff. Um, and if for any reason at all our frontline staff are unable to resolve the complaint with that customer on that call, then the next step would be for them to escalate it over to their team manager, which takes us into stage two. So stage two with that process, the team manager would contact the customer and again aim to resolve the call um, and the complaint with them on that call. If for any reason at all the manager is unable to agree to a resolution with the customer, we would then move into stage three. Stage three is where the complaint is then reviewed and the resolution reviewed by the comp. And at that point, it's decided whether it would um, need to offer something different or whether we would issue what we call a letter of deadlock. So the letter of deadlock just allows the customer to take their case to be independently reviewed by an independent adjudicator such as CSAS. Um, so we have many different ways that customers can get in touch with us. Um, so we have the phone um, where we allow our customers to call into us, which is our ideal way of resolving um, any customer queries because it's in real time. And obviously, you know, it, it's, you can get the uh, resolution to the customer as quickly as possible. However, we do have still white mail access for them to come through to us. Um, Obviously, this is slowing down with the way that the generations are going. Um, so we do have an also online um, access for customers via email or via our web chat form if they feel that that's the best way for them to contact us. If I can just move on. Yeah, thank you. Yep, so this slide here is just to give you a bit of um, background in terms of CSAS. So CSAS is the Communication and Internet Service Adjudication Scheme. Um, so, like I say, they are completely independent. Um, they will review cases based on information that is provided by the customer, and then they will do an independent review of how we've handled that complaint. Awards can be given anything up to £10,000 in terms of monetary value, but they can be non-monetary as well. Within our communication that we give to our customers, when we are, do issue letters out to them, below um, is exactly the information that we provide to them. So we will give them the address if they prefer to write to them. We provide the email address for CSAS and the relevant contact number as well in case they want to contact that via that method. And it's um, beneficial to note that those services are usually free to use. So we, again, another reason why a customer can go and have that independently um, looked into if they feel that we've not met the resolution that they wanted. At this point now, we'll hand back over to Neil. Thank you, Charlotte. So, can the next slide, please? Fantastic, thank you. So, this slide shows the amount of cases or deadlock complaints we have signposted our customers to CSAS from 2018 up until March 2021. So the previous slide, Charlotte talked you through our customer ownership process. So all these customers would have gone through that process. So they would have escalated their complaint to the agent. The um, agent would have escalated their complaint to the team manager. The team manager would have escalated their complaint to their manager for a final review. And then the comment at that point will decide, do we go with the customer's resolution and accept their complaint, or alternatively um, reject their complaint and offer them the details of CSACs? So as you can see, guys, the, the first um, bit of information I want to draw you to is the black line at the bottom. So the black line is just the cases we provided customers to go to CSAS in 2018 
And as you can see, on average, we were signposting our customers, 200 customers um, per month in, in, into CSAPs. The gray line that you can see just above it is, is the smart cases we've signposted our customers to in 2019. And as you can see, that's just under 600 customers. So as you, as you can see, everybody, that from 200 complaints in 2018, rising to just under 600 complaints in 2019. So quite a significant amount um, of volume just in 12 months. The, the, the next uh, bit of information I'll point you to is the information in red. So this, this is this, the case that we've signed post our customer to CSAS in 2020. And as you can see, other than the sort of main June time, where we see a reduction, September, October, November, and December, we saw on average over 1,000 cases going to CSAS per month. And I'm sure at this point, Justine and her team were quite overwhelmed with the volume and probably didn't sleep um, very well at night in terms of how much volume they were receiving. Then, as you can see, bring us the blue line brings us into 2021. So uh, January, February, and March. And as you can see, the trend continued to increase. Um, and in March, we saw a record-breaking number of customers going to CSAS, which exceeded um, 1,600 customers, which is just an enormous amount of customers that were signposted into CSAS. So that's where we were based on the old process and where we were with the coming volumes to CSAS. So may I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So we haven't really reinvented the wheel with this process. It's just a small change that brought some amazing results. So we spent time reviewing our customer escalation process, and we need to take back control of it. With potentially hundreds of team managers all referring our customers to CSAS for a number of different reasons. So every team manager in the business had to follow this process or the previous process. So they potentially would signpost our customers to CSAS, all different departments. With a little more, bit more understanding of the customer journey, we could prevent our customers going to CSAS and more importantly, resolve their complaint first time. As I said, Charlotte taught you through the old way of working and we want to make a change to the stage three. So the agent will still raise a complaint to their manager, but instead of their manager raising their complaint to their manager, their comp, they would um, signpost their complaint to a new team we've created. So we create a team of eight people um, to spend time reviewing the customer journey and with the insight of the speed team, we're able to provide feedback to the team manager to help them offer an alternative resolution. So this team was made up of experienced complaint handlers um, with the expert knowledge in all areas. So they could review that customer complaint end to end and almost feel that it's just the right thing to do for our customers. And if they were to reject the complaint, they could go back to the team manager and offer an alternative resolution. Some cases we absolutely accepted because it was the right thing to do for the business and also our, our customer. So this team is, is now in place. So if I can go to the next slide, please, and I'll show you some numbers and some details. So as, as you can see, guys, from January, February, and March, they're the numbers that carried on increasing. Since we put this team in place, um, you can see that the volume um, of customers being signed for to CSAS has massively come down. So April, May, and June, we've seen a significant um, reduction in terms of volume, but we're absolutely uh, proud um, to see the numbers come in in July, 659 cases um, or complaints being signed post to CSAS. So that's really record-breaking numbers in terms of the success of this team. Just a small change to our process has almost reduced our cases into CSAS by over 1,000. Um, which is absolutely amazing. So, can I have the next slide, please? Thank you. So, these are the total number of um, deadlocks that the team have reviewed. So, since March, we've, we've had a total of 4,309 cases reviewed by the team. Now, we'll look at this in, in two different ways. Firstly, 2,073 cases were accepted because that's the right thing to do. These are cases where a customer's expectation in terms of resolving their complaint is not something we can adhere to. Whether their expectation of um, credit is high more or way more higher than we would expect, or they're asking for an unrealistic resolution. So therefore we signpost them to CSAS because that's the right thing to do for the 
customer and also the business. When the success has, has really come in, there's a 2,236 cases that have been rejected. So when the team manager passes their deadlock to the team, we review that end to end and we look at the customer journey and we look at can we offer an alternative resolution? So if the customer wants, say, £100 and the team manager has valued that resolution at £30, what that team will do is they will look at the end to end journey that customers complain. They will look for any missed callbacks that the customers have not, not had or any sort of shortfall in the customer journey. And they will provide the team manager with the feedback and actually say, we think we could go about the customer and maybe offer them a different amount. Yes, it may not be 100, but we think 30 pounds that you've offered the customer um, is a little bit lower than our valuation. So we would tightly ask the team manager to go back to the customer and try and renegotiate a resolution. So those 2,236 customers, instead of going to CSATs, we actually managed to um, resolve their complaint first time for them, which is just um, a brilliant um, experience for the customers, getting their complaint resolved first time, rather than going down the CSAT route, which can take up to 12 weeks to get their complaint resolved. So there's some unbelievable numbers we're sharing here today. So the next slide, please. So I'm now going to hand you over to, to Charlotte to go through the, the final part of the presentation. Thank you, Neil. Um, so as you can see from this slide here, um, we have been able to get some data together in terms of the CSAS volumes between March and June. Um, so in the blue columns, we're looking at the, the amounts that have been going through to CSAS in March, and they are relative to the amount of money that the customer is requesting as part of their resolution as you can see the lower end of the spectrum so whether it's zero amount um, one to hundred pounds uh, uh, even up to a 500 pounds that there is a significant amount of complaints going through to csas for such a, lot, a small volume which commercially just doesn't make any sense at all um since we've implemented the new changes with the deadlock team being in place the deadlock team reviewing, as Neil mentioned, you know, customer's journey from end to end and has been able to, you know, return with an alternative resolution. We've actually seen a significant drop in the amount of cases going through to CSAS for low end amounts, as you can see in the June column, which is there in orange. Now, you will see that there are, is a slight increase in the cases from the 500 plus um, in terms of the, the lower end and that's absolutely fine because they are the types of cases that we would expect to go through to CSAS as Neil uh, referenced if we have a customer you know that their expectations are just beyond what we feel is is a right resolution then they are the cases that we would expect to go through to CSAS um, whereas the lower end scales if we look at an overall journey where a customer you know has been with us for for 10 years never complained um, and have had, you know, not a great service from us and, you know, and are looking to have a, a £10 late payment fee removed, then that is something that we would look to do um, rather than, you know, putting that customer through the process of CSAS. Um, so again, just some significant and absolutely excellent results um, from the team. If we can move to the next slide, please, Chantel. So on this slide here, we are, have been able to identify top five reasons as to why we are rejecting um, deadlock requests from, from the business at the moment. Um, as you can see there, there's quite a, a difference between each and every one of them. The first one being process not followed. So this could be where we've missed um, a manager callback or we've not updated the relevant systems in terms of notes or the actual complaint itself with the, the true reflection of the conversation. So it's missed um, opportunity there. Another option that we've found is further action required. So this could be, again, for example, that we've just not booked a technician for the customer um, or we've not sent out the relevant equipment to help them resolve their um, issues. If that's something to do with internet, we, you know, we're not provided the, the correct pods, anything at all such as that, we'll go back and, and again, discuss an alternative resolution with that customer. Another one that we've got is further credits required. So again, this is to reflect the customer experience. Again, referencing what Neil had mentioned prior um, in the other slide, where if we feel that you know the £30 that you've offered just doesn't cover the full um, 
customer journey, then we may go back and say, actually, in fact, could you go back with a different um, offer to that customer? Um, and next one would be the complaint not fully investigated. So this one's probably one of the, the, the main concerns for us in terms of reviewing a complaint end to end. We want to be looking at the overall journey of that customer. So it could be that, you know, don't just look back over this last week. You could be looking back over months or even a year, depending on, you know, how long that, that issue has been ongoing for that customer. And it's about reviewing that fully and taking everything into account and making a, a you know a, an offer of resolution based on that so that's one that we would push back for um and then the last letter is fca complaints um so we do have some cases where after reviewing them we actually identify them as an fca complaint um, and with fca complaints they follow their own adjudication which is FOS. so we would reject that complaint back to the agent and say relog that as an fca complaint and that can follow its own correct process um, so by identifying them, what we've been able to do is, is, is close the feedback loop within the business to stop these types of complaints coming back through as a deadlock request. And that's what's resulted in, in the massive reduction in complaints as well. So next slide. Yep, so that's the end of our presentation today. So just I say on behalf of myself and obviously Neil, um, Justine and Tracy, thank you so much for taking the time to listen to us today. Um, I'll pass back over to Chantal now um, for any questions that you may have. That's great. Thank you very much, Charlotte. And thank you, Neil, as well. Um, so, yeah, like Charlotte said, if you've got any questions, please post them into the chat box and I'll put them to our team. I have got a couple um, ready and waiting. So our first question, it's uh, regarding... Let me just, sorry, expand. It's not letting me see the whole question. Bear with me a second. Here we go. Um, so the question, it's quite a long one. So if you need me to repeat it, please let me know. Uh, so where does Ofcom's ADR awareness come into this process if rejecting the deadlock, making the customer aware of the complaints policy and also a response to non-FCA complaints to advise the complaint resolution and that this will be held for 28 days? A good question that one <laughs> have we got anyone to answer that one yeah justine is that, is that something you're your area of expertise um i can i can try and and help um i'm not sure about the 28 days but i, I can say that the all bm customers have the relevant information about the claim to csas um, printed on their bills and sent in the correspondence um, sent to them so they, they are aware of the process. We are obliged to give that information. Sorry, Chantal, can you just repeat it again, the question, because I think it was quite long and in a couple of parts. Absolutely. So the first part was where does Ofcom's, a Ofcom's ADR awareness come into this process if rejecting the deadlock? So, yeah, the, the awareness is that we do advise our, the customers that they are entitled to go through the Ofcom adjudication process, and that is via CSAS. So Ofcom say that we have to have an independent mediation service. There are two available to us, um, the Ombudsman Service and CSAS. We chose to go with CSAS, and um, that's who we're signed up with, and that's where we signpost our customers. Perfect, thank you. Lisa, I hope that answers your question. Um, we've got a question from Lucy. Has the amount of compensation Virgin Media O2 risen to avoid the number of small cases going to deadlock CSAS case? I'll, I'll go and take this one. So I, I, I think potentially yes, but that's the right thing to do for the customer. So what, we, what we're trying to do when we reject a complaint is not only to help the customer, but also to help educate the team managers because if they're if they're in, if they're in a um in a in a role that they do day in day out they don't necessarily see the wider business so what we're trying to do is 
know, we're trying to get the team actually look at the wider the wider um, complaint, look at the customer journey over, like Charlotte said, maybe 12 months, rather than just over the, the, the four days loss of service that, that the customers have had. Um, and that's something we, we are working with um, in the business to look at our credit spend, to see how, what impact it does have on us. And like I said, guys, this process is only four months in, and we are, we are starting to see an increase in credits but potentially that that's the right thing to do. So as, as we go on with this process, we'll certainly review that and, and just see what, what the best um, outcome uh, in the future is with regarding credits versus um, you know, asking a customer to contact CSS. Yeah, so it, it's something that absolutely will come in the future. Thanks. Can Carol. I just add something to that as well? This is Tracy, um, that I'm in the team that does the new way of working. We, what we're finding a lot of the time is when we are getting the deadlock requests, it is like Neil and, and Charlotte have explained, they might have been offered a £10 credit or something. But what we've got the time to do in this dedicated team is to go right back through that customer's journey. And they may be ringing about a fault, which can't be helped, that they've just got currently. But we'll go back through the year or two years and look, have they had any other poor customer journey have they had any more faults and look at the whole thing as, as the big picture and actually base what we're offering not on what they're complaining about now but what's made them unhappy with virgin media and made them come to this decision to raise this complaint because sometimes someone can raise a complaint and they can mention just one thing but when you dig deeper they've actually got a few things that they're unhappy about so it's actually trying to cover everything that's made them dissatisfied and offer something that really is relevant to the inconvenience that they've had. And that's why it's probably gone up. And on average, you could get someone where they've been offered £10 and they might pay £40 a month. And I might say, well, OK, offer them £40 for a month free because that's worth doing to actually save the customer's loyalty to us, really. That's great, Tracy. Thank you. You might be able to help me with this one as well, actually. So Jane has asked, do you have differently skilled staff for each stage? No, our team, there's eight of us, as it's been explained, and um, we're all very, very experienced. We all are in the executive team and have been for many, many years. And um, we've got a lot of tenure between us and we can cover everything. We have got some mobile experts, cable experts, and but we cover everything and we know how to do the job that the guys that are coming to us do so we can help in every way you know be it that we're asking a manager to go back and offer a new package or send replacement equipment we've got the knowledge to know what it needs to have to resolve this complaint that's great thank you jane i hope that answers your question um we've had a question from bethany how are the cases escalated to the deadlock team is this through live calls or as a case neil you're probably better with this one aren't you <laughs> thank you yeah so we currently with, with our management system what the manager can do is when, when the complaint uh, gets assigned to them as part of escalation they can click on uh, like an escalation button what the manager does is they, they put in all their information of why they feel uh, deadlock csas is, is the best option for the customer and what that does is that gets rooted into a bucket and then that bucket gets distributed um, to the team of eight so tracy made me comment she'll get five cents to her and what she'll do is she'll review those independently and then if she accepts then the complaint goes into justine's team if she rejects then what that do is that sends it straight back to the team manager and then Tracy has the opportunity to put some notes and some feedback with it within why we rejected it. It could be the fact that you know you've not followed the process because the manager has just literally flipped on escalate and to straight into the team. And we've not seen any notes to suggest the team manager has had a conversation with, with the customer, uh, or alternatively, we'll put a recommendation uh, resolution that we feel is fair and consistent with, with, with the business. And then the team manager can then go back to the customer. But that doesn't always end because sometimes you know the team managers do. Um, put the recommendation in place, but then the customer still rejects it. So then what will happen then is the team manager then rejects it um, and it back to ourselves by saying, you know, I've had the recommendation in place, the customer has still rejected it and still wants to go to CSAS. And at that point, we'll, we'll, we will accept that and send that through to, to just the team um, and, and CSAS. Perfect. Thank you, Neil. Uh, Bethany, I hope that answers your question. 
Uh, so Maxine has asked, do you have regulatory deadlines to adhere to once the manager says that the complaint has been raised? Yeah, so in terms of obviously um, we do have our own um, expectations in terms of how long it takes for, for you know, a complaint to be looked into. Um, obviously, we give ourselves a 28 day window to you know, resolve the customer's complaint. However, we aim to have that done as quickly as possible. So as soon as that case is escalated by our team manager, it will come through to our team and our team distribute those cases out on the day to our team of eight and they will work through them as quickly as possible and aim to have them back and um, tracy correct me if i'm wrong um within the 40 hour window um to let them know whether they were accepting or rejecting yeah i mean there is within a 48 hour window but to be honest we are on top of things and they're normally done a lot quicker than that so for example a customer might be escalated to us on a monday and by tuesday afternoon they could have had an offer they've accepted the offer and that's all been closed off you know so they're not waiting a long time to get this it's actually something that's happening very quickly so they're not waiting days and days for a phone call the minute that we send it back to the manager the manager comes on shift will call the customer and make that offer so it is very quick in in terms of regulation um, a customer can make a claim to CSAS if they're deadlocked or um, after 56 days of um, no resolution. That's great, everybody. Thank you. Uh, Maxine, I hope that answers your question. And Maxine's actually asked another question. So um, you did touch uh, briefly on this in your presentation, uh, but once deadlock is requested by the customer, can you decline sending the customer to CSAS? Um, do you want me to pick this one up? Um, yeah, yeah it, it is. It, we can only um, signpost a customer to CSAS. The customer has to actually make a complaint to them. We don't do that on their behalf. So they, are, they are signposted at that point and they can choose to go through that service or not. That's great, Justine. Thank you, Maxine. I hope that answers your, your next question. Um, so Levi has asked, do the deadlock team uh, deal with customers directly or do they only speak internally to the team manager handling the complaint? Yeah, I'll answer that one. So we get them, as um, Neil and Charlotte have said, through an automated system and it gets directed to us. We then will look at it and if we're going to offer a resolution to the customer, it's sent back to the manager that they spoke to initially and that manager will ring the customer again. So it's a better journey for that customer because they're dealing with the same person. We don't, at this stage, speak to the customer. The manager will pass on the offer that we've decided on when we've had this senior review, but it will be the same manager that calls the customer back. That's great, thank you, Tracy. Maxine, I hope that answers your question. Um, sorry, Levi, I hope that answers your question. Uh, Maxine, we've got another question from, uh, how do you handle the serial complainers? Um, okay, I'll, I'll take this one. Yes, I'm sure we all get the serial complainers that, that won't for better word, won't go away. I mean, sometimes we, we, we have to really put a barrier for that customer. So as long as we've done the right thing and signposted them correctly to CSAS, like Justine said, it is on the customer to contact CSAS. We have um, a template that we give our customers that data and says, you know, your complaint has been reviewed. You've now exhausted our complaints process. We can see we provide you a deadlock letter on this date. Um, and politely, can you please now engage CSAS as you've exhausted our complaints process? So, so yeah, sometimes it's not always straightforward as that, and we do have to maybe speak to a customer um, to try to get them to, to contact CSAS, and sometimes that can be really time consuming, but ultimately, if you get any customers to come through via email, we have a template that just sends it back to say, you know, your complaint has been uh, reviewed by a senior manager, um, and now can you please politely ask you to, uh, to contact CSAS. So yeah, but they, 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 they do come around, but we do try to get them to contact CSAS. 
Thank you, Neil. Um, I know Tracy um, touched on this uh, just slightly, um, but Ad Abdullah has asked, do you tend to deal with all the complaints or different issues under the one complaint? So I know, Tracy, you said before you might have a look and, and see that they've only complained about one thing, but you'll go back and see there's actually a series of things um, to, to, to look at rather than that just single thing. Yeah. No, we'll deal with everything. So if they made one one complaint could have any number of things in it. It could be about service, billing, you know, the customer services. It could be about the signal in their area, any number of things, but we'll deal with all of it. And we can go back to a manager with a resolution to each one of them. So, you know, we could tell a manager to do a number of things to try and resolve this before we deadlock it, if we can see that that can be done. So, for example, if it was a fault one, we could offer, we could ask the manager to send pods if it was for a um, Wi-Fi problem. If they've got a fault and we think that, you know, that we should send an engineer, we can ask them to do that. We can ask them to offer compensation if we feel that they've raised a complaint and, you know, they've been dealing with us for a long time and we feel that that's owed to them. We'll cover everything in one um, complaint. We wouldn't have separate ones, we'd deal with everything. That's great, thank you Abdullah. I hope that, excuse me, <clears throat> I hope that answers your question. Um, we've got another question from Lucy. Uh, are you also noticing a reduction now in the number of repeat complaints too, or is it too early to tell? And she also says she hopes it does reduce for you guys. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, have you, have, you, have you seen a reduction or, or just being obviously we've, we've seen the reduction in, in the volumes but have, have we seen a reduction in terms of repeat, repeat customers? Do you mean the same one coming to us for deadlock and then coming back again? Yeah so I think that mean you know if for example um, you know a particular individuals send a deadlock that you've rejected um, are you, once you pass the feedback back through to them are you seeing that as a repeat or are they actually taking your feedback on board and you're seeing less of the same people and the same types coming through? Yeah, well, what sometimes happen is we might reject it for a reason and then they may come back again. And and if they've done whatever, the, if we've given them actions for why we're rejecting it, if they've done that and followed it through and then they've still not been able to resolve it, they will come back. And at that stage, we will deadlock it once we can see that every effort has been made to resolve it and the customer's not accepting anything offered, then we will. So it's a very low number, but we do get them where we reject it and then it comes through again. That's great. And we Thank do you. collect that. We collect that data and, um, you know, obviously we are running reports on it and then th that will be addressed with, you know, the people that are rejecting them. Thank you, Tracy. Lucy, I hope that answers your question. Uh, we've got a few questions left. Um, so Tracy has asked, what, L what SLA do this ring fence team work to recontract, uh, sorry, recontact the customer and offer an alternative resolution? So um, that one is ideally we've set a 40 hour window, but as Tracy mentioned earlier, we are working a lot quicker because we are on top of the deadlocks coming in. But we do go out to the wider business and advise it is a, a 40 hour for them to review and come back to them. Yeah, I mean, what one thing that, that the team, we can't influence what we can influence. So when a team manager passes uh, uh, complaint to us, we will try to, to review that within 24 to 40 hours and get it back to the team manager if it has been um, rejected. One thing we don't police um, right now is how much um, time the team manager spends on recontacting that customer. So we, currently we don't know if that team manager spends a week trying to get with that customer or they call them the same day or they call them in 40 hours. But it's something in sort of phase two, phase three, going to be looking at in terms of the SLAs for the team managers or the complaint has been rejected but at this moment in time it's not something we capture we just try to make sure within within 24 40 hours any complaints that come to us they are reviewed and either sent to Justine's team if accepted or sent back to the team manager if we feel that there's a little bit more work to do and we do feel we can get a resolution um, with, with the customer. That's great. Thank you, Tracy. I hope that answers your question. Um, Debbie has asked, do you have any data yet on how this is all impacting retention rates? 
Um, there's, there's no data in terms of attention rates. What we are looking at doing is looking at a, a scorecard for each centre. So, for example, if our team of attentions, we're going to give them a scorecard which basically says, you know, this month they've sent 50 deadlocks to us um, and we rejected, for example, 45. And what we can do is we can drill that down to sort of team manager and agent and making sure the team manager is supported in terms of their escalation conversations. Alternatively, the scorecard can also show some of the great work the centres are doing. So if we're getting um, escalations from a part of the business where we're accepting you know, 95 percent of their deadlocks because the inputs um, and the feedback has been put in place and again we can celebrate that as well but, but again that's something that's later on down the line where we can give each centre uh, its own scorecard a link in with a HUD and just sort of celebrate that the great team managers where their deadlocks are being, uh, being successful and alternatively provide a little bit of feedback to the team managers that maybe aren't successful first time but with their resolutions to customers yeah so it's certainly something we hope to share with you and come back um, next year and just sort of share our, our further insight and then um, future way of working with you. That's great, thank you, Neil. Um, I'm going, just got a couple um, questions left um, as time's marching on. What I will do is Neil's given me permission to give his email address out. So if anybody has any questions and they'd like to directly contact um, Neil for an answer, I'll pop his uh, email address in the chat box, but it will also be included in the follow-up email that you'll all receive within the next 24 hours. Um, but I've just, I'll just, um, we've got quite a few questions left. I'll just uh, pick a couple, it's, as I say, I'm just conscious time's marching on. Um, so there's a really good question from Deborah um, that says, do you have any different processes for vulnerable customers? Yeah, really, really good question. Yes, we, we have a flag uh, system that highlights a customer is, is, is vulnerable. And what that does is that it gives the customer priority to faults, uh, especially the phone line. So if the phone line runs down, we try to get the tech out the same day or within 24 hours. Um, as I say, priority with, with any, any sort of faults. With complaints, we'll always do what we can in terms of um, support for the customer. But ultimately, you know, we have to balance that need with, with the business as well. So if we can support a vulnerable customer with maybe they've made some high volume calls, normally the system would, would just disconnect them. Um, due to non-payment, but we'll absolutely work with the, with the vulnerable customer to see what we can do. But ultimately, I'm afraid that you know, the bill does need to be paid. It doesn't necessarily we'd say we would clear the balance because they're vulnerable, but we'll put every step in place to make sure that they've still got their service um, that, that, that they need. Um, but, but yes, it, it's something that we are absolutely aware of in terms of supporting their, their fault service. But in, in complaints, it's something that we, we do our best try and support them and ultimately try and keep their service on um, as best we can. That's great. Thank you, Neil. Deborah, I hope that answers your question. Um, we've got a, a question here from Brian. It's quite a long one, so if you need me to repeat, please let me know. Um, so Brian has asked, if a customer expresses initial dis dis sorry, I'll start that again. <laughs> um, if a customer expresses initial dissatisfaction do you actively encourage them to make a complaint or do you try to give a little extra time to advisors to resolve the issue to prevent the complaint? So in essence, keeping the complaints to more complex issues. Well, in terms of our, our process, if a customer expresses a level of dissatisfaction, our agents are, you know, you know to, to sort of raise a complaint with the customer's permission. And it's we ask the agents on for example to do their absolute best to resolve it on the day so they have the power to close down a complaint with the customer's permission as well and um, it's only if they're unable to resolve it at that point would it escalate further um, but yes we, we, we try and acknowledge all levels of dissatisfaction because some customers are more upfront about complaining and some want to but just don't you know we're not sort of you know in your face in terms of raising that complaint they'll be subtle subtly telling you that they're dissatisfied and um, so we just try and uh, acknowledge them all that's great thank you let me just see if there's any quick ones we can squeeze in uh, yeah there's a short one here from john that says are your complaints team working office hours so, so currently hours. Oh, yeah, I was yeah. going to say we, we have we have sort of two levels of complaint teams at the moment. So we have the um, we have the CEO team that deal with the high level um, complaints, which hold the deadlock team, 
um, and we're in the process of obviously having a look at hours in terms of what we're doing, but we don't just work the nine to five. We do start from eight o'clock in the morning at the moment. We work right the way through to eight o'clock at night. Um, whereas the frontline complaint teams, they um, will work anything between um, eight o'clock in the morning um, to nine o'clock at night. That's great, thank you. And that sort of ties into Levi's question, actually. Um, just uh, roughly how many cases uh, did the dead to deadlock team handle on a, a typical day? Have you got the figures for that, Neil? Um, so the target, the target um, for the deadlock team is we'd expect them to um, review three cases per hour. So obviously you can, you can do your maths, you get eight people doing three cases per hour. So that, that's the guy's target um, per, per day. So yeah, it's it's what it's, it's 50 plus in, in terms of how many complaints we, we review uh, each, each and every day. Yeah. So the target is three an hour um, based on obviously eight people, but obviously with, with absence and, and holidays and so on, we probably have about six, seven people reviewing the cases. Um, per month, so yeah, it's, it's about maybe 100, 150 cases um, per day. That's great, thank you so much. There are a couple of questions that we haven't been able to get to. As, again, I'm, I'm very conscious that time is marching on. Um, so what I've done is I've popped Neil's email address in the chat box. And again, it's in the follow-up email for you guys when uh, the follow-up email comes up comes out within the next 24 hours. Um, I'm just gonna close the session off. Uh, if all the presenters are happy, yeah, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. So that concludes today's session. I would just like to uh, take the time to say thank you to everybody for joining us today. Um, I hope that you have thoroughly enjoyed the content and found it very informative and thought provoking. A very special thank you to Neil, Charlotte, Justine and Tracy from our longstanding members, Virgin Media Row 2, uh, for delivering today's session and answering all of your questions. Uh, if you Again, if you do have any further questions, please feel free to reach out to Neil. His details are in the chat box. Uh, for more information on membership of the UK Contact Centre Forum and for a full list of all upcoming UK CCF webinars, please visit our website www.uk-ccf.co.uk. We look forward to welcoming you all again soon. Thank you very much. Stay safe and goodbye. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, guys. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.